Okay. Uh, you heard about the HWRF, GFDL, AHW, and the COAMPS. Uh, I was asked by Bob Gall and Naomi to see if for the 2009 season we could put together some results from ensembling these forecasts of the storms of 2009 season. Uh, that was not an easy task, so because of all the variabilities you've already seen, and to put those together. Uh, so let me begin with saying that there were only 28 cases, which would be called homogeneous cases, going out to 120 hours of forecast from all the models. And there were something of the order of another 30 cases where they were totally heterogeneous. Some made forecasts and some did not, and some stopped too early and so forth. So doing an ensembling, <laughs> that was not our experience. In the past, when we did these kinds of things, uh, we did these with global models and the same suite of global models that were talked about at this meeting. The, and then we found that you took the previous year's forecast and keep adding forecasts as they got completed and verified into that basket because the kind of unsettling we were doing entailed both a training phase where some statistics was calculated and then that statistics was made use of towards the construction of the super ensemble for track and intensity. Uh, 2009 has many limitations, but I'll just point those out to you and perhaps say something about how we might be able to address the 2010 season. Um, these are all the storms of the 2009 season, so you can see first of all, the sample was small. And unfortunately, I did not have the 2008 season from the same models. I did request Jim Doyle and NCAR, and I wrote many emails and found that I could not uh, collect a training phase at all for those because there was one, so many different difficulties. So we started almost raw from the beginning of the 2009 season to its end. And so I had to use what is called cross-validation, which is uh, jackknifing or whatever some people call it. And so you get the statistics from those. And then, you, in other words, you make the statistics out of the storm you're not forecasting. Uh, I'm sorry, no, out of the storms you're not forecasting and then use it for the storm you're forecasting. That's cross-validation. And that, uh, anyway, was not what we were doing previously. But anyway, uh, the NRL, HRD, NSEP, GFDL, NCAR, Chris Davis, and we also ran at FSU one of the ARW versions with our own choice of physics. So in effect, we had seven models, the COAMPS, HWRX from HRD, and two versions of the HWRF from EMC, the GFDL, and Chris Davis's ARW, and the FSU ARW. And I'm not going to say much about all the specifications. Uh, almost all the models had parameterized cumulus convection except for the innermost domain of the Chris Davis's ARW, which was cloud resolving. I don't know what uh, impact that has. That too has to be studied in some detail at some point. Uh, anyway, so, and the global models that provided the analysis uniformly were GFS except for the co-amps. And in the end, various types of ensembles were constructed. One is the simple ensemble mean, and then we also corrected what's called a bias corrected ensemble mean from this small sample. So you take the forecast minus the observed and you make the bias correction. Uh, this, I, I have to tell you the history behind all this. Uh, there is a huge amount of work going on at FSU in NWP, climate, seasonal climate, and these same kinds of tools or variations thereof have been used. And we have found value in most of these. But then uh, when you are dealing with data sets such as uh, uh, provided by the global centers, the, has many years of forecast, then the training phase is very robust. And 
we have found very good use of these same ensembling constructions. But when the sample size is small, I keep on repeating, <laughs> there are major problems. OK. Anyway, uh, the super ensemble, which was mentioned by Jim Franklin in the context of the FSC super ensemble, I mean, it has a training phase. And it does not assign an equal weight to all the models after the biases are determined statistically. Uh, so it carries weights which are fractional, positive, negative, and whatever. And then those are used in the forecast phase. And it's very powerful. So, and this can only be seen from the kind of work that we have been doing in various areas, including uh, hurricanes in the past when we had robust uh, databases. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of that. The correlation-based model ensembles is another one uh, that was put together in our lab just recently, tested again in weather and climate, and is very robust. What you do, in effect, is you, if you have the observed values of the latitude, longitude, and intensity for each leave time, and the model-based forecast for the same, you calculate the correlations of these, and then you normalize these. And that's an elaborate procedure. And then you utilize these coefficients for the construction of the correlation-based model ensembles. And we found this to be one of the uh, quite powerful schemes, uh, except for the limitations. So the motivation for this work came from our previous work on hurricanes, and which was tried both for global models with the FSU super ensemble and also was tried for another suite of mesoscale models. And in, in those days, I mean, when the sample size was large and the training base was robust, and as we moved into the, for, uh, the current year, we were adding storms as they were completed. Uh, these kinds of results we were obtaining, this is the year of 2004 when there were a large number of storms. In the far right is the the performance of the super ensemble in terms of track errors on the top and the intensity errors on the right. And uh, this was possible because we always had, of the order of 70 cases, for the 60 to 70 cases in the training phase of the super ensemble. Uh, when, and this is a kind of track improvement that the super ensemble was providing. This is Francis and in the uh, the kind of track forecast, uh, right bias, and so forth. I mean, this is considerably reduced from the super ensemble. This was typical of forecast that we had made in 2004 and followed up by the other group that's doing it currently. In the mesoscale, uh, Naomi provided uh, some data sets. And then we did put together an in number of models at that time. Uh, this was a few years ago. And our experience was very similar, that even for the mesoscale models, if the training phase was robust, you could reduce the errors from the construction of the multi-model super ensemble for both track and intensity. These were for the 2004, 5, and 6 seasons. And uh, overall, I think these results showed that compared to the member models, you could, for, for these seasons of 2004, 5, and 6, collectively, you can reduce the errors. And I think up, here is the nice feature of it, that these ensemble, a priori, you don't know when a forecast is issued and given to the hurricane center. They don't know which model is the best. You just saw the performances of the various models. For, a given storm, you don't know, but you can tell a priori that one of these ensemble methods, uh, such as the bias corrected ensemble mean here, or the uh, ensemble mean, those will uh, immediately after the forecast you could say that this could be a good product, and some of the close neighbors might be one of the best models. And so, I mean, this is the kind of information we had used in the past. Uh, we also tried something knowing in the 2004, 5, and 6 seasons that both large-scale models were doing quite well, as well as mesoscale models, they were doing quite well, that perhaps some combinations of those might work. So we simply explored 
possible combinations of large scale models and small scale models, but I have to say that um, a few seasons still does not stabilize any of these things. Uh, but these are worth exploring, and uh, this was just very exploratory. Um, going on to the 2009 season, there were nine storms, of which three of them were so short-lived, it was not worth I mean, going much into those, and um, so I'm not going to show those. Anna, Danny, Erica, Fred, Grace, and Henry, these were the storms that we looked at more carefully. Uh, and typically, as soon as a forecast was completed, uh, this is what uh, uh, GFDL, HWRF, NCAR, and HWRFX, all these uh, participating groups under the umbrella of HFIP, <laughs> they were sending the forecast uh, collectively to, so that we could pull them out and look at them and see the performance of these storm by storm as they came by. Track forecasts in general were quite good in, in the case of ANAB, except that, again, uh, some, uh, some forecasts were taking it too fast and others were taking it too slow. But in general, the tracks were very similar headed in the case of Anna, but it was the intensity forecast where uh, some models such as HWRFX uh, was somewhat overestimating and some models such as our model and uh, were underestimating and the NCAR model was closer to the ensemble mean which was clo closer to the reality of, of the forecast for that storm. Uh, but there was considerable variability from storm to storm and who was number one, if, if you go by this kind of numbering, uh, then you, they varied from almost everybody had a chance to become a number one at one time or another. <laughs> um, again, you go to Danny of 2009, uh, and again, the tracks were impressive, and they were all very similar, uh, except that a few of them were uh, slower and some were slightly faster, but the intensity was again uh, HWRF and the NCAR model were slightly overestimating at times. Uh, the ensemble mean was somewhat closer again to reality and some models were uh, way underestimating as the four kilometer HWRF, uh, HWRF four stands for that and HWRF nine was more reasonable in this case. I'll show you the overall statistic shortly. Um, for Danny, yeah, this, these are the statistics for the track and error. I think it's almost meaningless to look at the statistics of a single storm. We're not there yet. We need to, uh, what do we need? I <laughs> think what we need, if, you're, if you are going to lean on ensembles, then you have to stabilize the statistics for the ensembles a lot more. Then this kind of variability will be handled much better by the ensembling technique. Uh, anyway, so just let us look at the different models. Five, okay. I think I'm gonna move on. Uh, let me just say one or two in detail. You're looking at the GFDL, which carries the large track errors in the light blue at hours 48 and 60. Why aren't we showing it all the way out to the 120 hours? Because Danny did not exist beyond that hour, and many models did not carry their forecast, so that you can see some gaps in the middle here and there. Uh, that's what we have to deal with. And also, we should, uh, I think HFIP sh should talk about that too for the completion of and production of a more homogeneous data set. Um, and if I look at the same, uh, Barb diagram for different storms. They look different, and the t distribution is, uh, I've seen uh, sometimes one and sometimes the other making the top, uh, anyway. And so uh, this is the same in the case of Erica, and here you can see we are showing the FSC super ensemble on the bottom left on the far right bar and you can see that it's doing very well, and so is the ensemble mean compared to all the member models for the intensity forecast. Uh, uh, although even those 
ensembling techniques are not consistent, if you take the average of all these ensembling techniques, such as the ensemble mean, bias removed ensemble mean, the correlation based and the super ensemble based, then those seem to do better. Uh, better, but not quite what you want. You can do, I feel that you can do far better if you had a better sample. And the sample is not asking for more storms in the next year. Sample is for using the same model and running more of those, more cases from 2009 and 2008. And if such an exercise was com were completed, I think we would have e uh, far better results. So let me just, uh, this shows a variety of differences and different start, start times for Hurricane Fred. And on the whole, you find that the same model, which is overestimating, tends to overestimate for the same storm. And those that are underestimating also do the same thing. Uh, and the, this is a shorter lived uh, thread. I think in this storm, uh, I was looking at the performance of different models like CloAMPs and so forth. And th they are very varied. In this particular forecast, the performance of CloAMPs was less than for other, other forecasts that I saw for that model. But you can look at some things like the FSU Super Ensemble, which is on the bottom uh, for both the track errors and for the intensity, and they're indeed very impressive. So it's just, you know, we were just beginning to see these things, but uh, this doesn't happen on every single storm. Uh, but in the case of Fred, as we were doing those, we saw that, and this is Grace. Anyway, I think I can just push it because it's almost, uh, let me go to, since I'm only, summary of performances for the 2009 season, the track and intensity for the whole season. And uh, overall, I, I, we found that the ensembling does help. If you take the average of the various ensemble constructions, then you can do better than these member models. Uh, so I'm gonna to go to my conclusions. Uh, we have looked at it many different ways and every possible permutation of these these are showing all the variabilities because of the data problems in each of the forecasts. Uh, the above figure showed that the performance of the best model, the bias corrected ensemble, mean the FSC super ensemble and the correlation burst uh, forecast errors for tracks and intrinsic for individual storms and the overall performance for different forecast hours. The three and five day position errors for the mesoscale ensembles were of the order of 225 kilometer and 600 kilometer respectively. They were slightly in excess of the position errors for our large scale suite of models during the same seasons. The three and five day intensity errors for the mesoscale ensembles for 2009 were of the order of 8.5 meter per second and 10 meter per second. Those were slightly better than the intensity errors. We had noticed previously the biggest problem in the study, of course, is the lack of sufficient number of forecast samples. Uh, I think I'm going to go to one more at the bottom one. It would be desirable to have the mesoscale modelers run a large number of past storms, as many as 60 forecasts to establish the statistical, statistical ensemble coefficients. Then I think we will be able to do as well as we have done for the large scale uh, counterparts. And acknowledgments go to different groups who consistently provided these forecasts. And the NJET that was provided by Bob Gall and Bob Gall and Naomi, who instigated this exercise. Thank you.